My name is Alan O'Donoghue. I'm a, a teacher of computing at Our Lady's Catholic High School in Preston. And it's a it's a dark Monday night here, and I, I guess you're somewhere safe, wrapped up at home with a dressing gowns and slippers and, and that kind of thing. And I'll be joining you, not in your home, <laughs> but I'll, I'll be doing something soon in about an hour or so. Now, um, I have a document which I'm sharing on screen at the moment, and you can see it's got a link at the top to that document. That's how you can come back later and watch this recording if, if you want double punishment. And there's lots of things in the recording, sorry, in the document that I'm going to mention. And I've got an agenda which I'm going to go on to in just a few moments. So um, if you want to know a little bit more about the kind of things I'm involved with, so I, as, as well as teaching in my school, Our Ladies High School in Preston, I also train teachers who either come to our school for a day, like today we had five teachers. We had Helen, Lisa, Damaris, and uh, Matthew and Stephen, they came here for a day to learn all about GCSE computing. And they, they're they getting their classes ready to teach the programming assignment, A453 for OCR. So we spent the day doing that sort of thing. Uh, you can find out a little bit more about that on there. And I have a Twitter handle where I share lots of things online for free. Like I've just recently shared some teaching resources. And I, I have a podcast online. I've not recorded more than the episodes recently because I'm doing a lot of these and I have a blog and at the moment I'm running a project as well as teaching I'm running this project called Jam Packed and it's taking lots of events around the country so like Hack the Future Rugby Jam and Hack Jams and we're traveling mostly the north of England so last week we were in Hull this week we're at Eccles in Manchester and we're looking for schools to come and visit we i keep saying we'll have a website soon but i just need to sit down for five minutes and type something in to the website so you can find out oh sue you were in hull great and um that you can find out about some of the events that are coming up so we, i have a stack of schools that are in a queue that i need to list their events on here so at the moment we've just got Eccles in manchester this week, um, we've got Mansfield, but in, in another week or so, when things slow down, um, a, a lot more events are going to appear on there. This has been funded by the Raspberry Pi Foundation and the DFE. And Simon, even if you are in Asia, the plan is that a lot, that all of the planning and resources and everything were sharing so that other people could decide that they're gonna offer something similar. You could cherry pick, you could think, like I'm going to show you something that we used in a moment. You could think that you might use that in your school and you don't even have to say that you got it from us. So the plan is that there's going to be 28 free online seminars. This is number six. That means there's 22 more to go. And we jam pack has a Twitter page. So Sue, I don't know if you've been on the Twitter thing, but you might be able to see a picture of yourself. We've got quite a few photographs that were posted online over those few days we were there. I don't know if you can see yourself in any of those pictures, but there's Dave, good old Dave, doing his Minecraft hacking, and there's some of our team afterwards, and there's lots of stuff there. So I'm just mentioning that all of these are at the top of that page there that you can have a look at should you choose to. So this webinar tonight is one of 28. You can register for future ones here. I need to change that date because the next one's not on the 24th of November. That's tonight. Also, I teach computing to teachers as i mentioned today the 24th of november we had a, we had some teachers come in spend a day they they spent the, the the morning doing some exercises and activities to help them teach the theory parts of computing gcse then they came to watch me teach a lesson that was period two and then we spent the day tackling the programming tasks that have been set by the exam board so there's now there'll be some more of those lined up soon and I also do some other things like teach Python courses. I'm doing one in Manchester in December, February, and Birmingham and London. And then so that's like the advert <laughs> or all the adverts. So this is our agenda for tonight. Now, I always try and keep the agenda to sharing some insights from some lessons that I've had this week or last week. And um, then I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about GCSE computing. And then we kind of have a question and answer just at the end. Good evening, Craig. Welcome. So Natalie 
posted some questions earlier in the chat. So the chat button you can see is down in the bottom left hand corner. And if anything occurs to you as the evening goes on, type a question in the chat and I'll either answer it straight away or I will pick up at the end of the session. So the plan is between now and about half past six, so it's about the next 20 minutes or so, I want to share with you some of the resources that, that we've been using at the moment uh, to help us teach computing in schools around the country. And then we're going to look at some aspects of the GCSE computing. So on Friday, we were in Hull, me and some of my friends and colleagues, and we went to a school there called the Kingswood Academy. They, they even printed out some flyers. Look at these jam-packed flyers. I, I saw them when I arrived at school. I'd never seen them before. I thought, whoa, that's great. So the we had we had a year group, we had year eight during the for the full day, and we had lots of teachers from other schools that came along and I'm keen to find out from those teachers whether it was whether it was actually of any practical use or not, because because they'll have had to take some time out of school to come and join us. And we had a few geeks from the university came along and they brought robots and things to demonstrate. We had we had code club there, and we had a number of different workshops in the afternoon. But in the morning, I I led a, like a three hour kind of, you could call it a hackathon in a way, but it was, we were looking at cyberbullying, e-safety, and we were using a tool called Twine. So I'm gonna share with you a little bit of some of the things that we did. I've just realized I need to find a document that will, that's got some links in that we can use. So I use Google Drive, I'm not sponsored by them in any way, but I just, I, I use Google Drive to help share some of the resources that we're using because it means if I make mistakes I can change them as we go along and here is a lesson plan now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put a link to this in the document so you've got it straight away if I click here to copy that link and go back to our document and I'll, I'll just put it here which says cyberbullying so later on if you click on that you'll find a link to these resources I'll just show you and explain the, the sort of thing that happened. So, get rid of that now. So, um, I had all the, the year group in the assembly hall in the morning, and as they came in, I just sort of said, hello, we're here today to work with you and get you thinking about a few things. And then I was going to present them with a scenario that with different stages of a story. Now, this is not so much about programming, but this is the, the sort of what you might call the, 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 the digital literacy element of the computing curriculum. Now this week, there'd been a few news items I'd heard of on the BBC. They were saying schools aren't doing enough to protect their children from being victims of cyberbullying. Like it's, like it's down to the teachers, it's the teacher's fault. And we actually focused on cyberbullying on, 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 on this particular day. So one of the things I wanted to explain to them was, looking ahead a little bit, was a story. Now this story takes you through stage by step, stage about something that might happen, like a typical kind of cyberbullying incident. And what would happen, um, I probably should have printed these out on the day and had them in my hands, but it's like an assembly hall, there's a, you know, a few hundred kids there sat in front of me, and it was probably just easier just to, to say it from my head and imagine I was there. So what I wanted them to do was to imagine that they were in a maths lesson, teacher was going through some topics and nobody in the class knew what to do apart from one child who put his hand up and then suddenly he starts getting um, a lot of unkind attention because he got the answer right and nobody did. So the question next to, to the groups were, how do you think that Joe might feel? What should he do? How do the others in the class feel? So I was trying to get them to empathize with Joe in that situation. And I was hoping that some of them would think, well, um, maybe I've been in one of those situations at, at some point, and what would I do if I found myself in that particular situation? So that was the first part. And then it was, right, now it's the end of the lesson, and um, Joe's leaving the room, but your friends decide that they're going to ignore him. So that was the next scene, and it's like, how do you think Joe might feel now he's been ignored? And then the next question was, what do you think you should do? Why are they acting like this? So apologies, Sue, if this feels like you're going back over it all again. Um, I'm not sure how useful you found that morning session. Um, it did feel a lot like chalk and talk to begin with. I was 
because we were in an assembly hall for for an hour or so and we didn't have computers available but um so the, so the, i presented the children during this assembly with various elements of this story stage by stage and at each point asking them questions about what to try and understand the feelings that were going through people's minds and then we get to the point where two days later joe's not in school and what's happened to joe and the police have come in and um <laughs> okay so sue managed to escape the session in the morning and the thing was what's happened to joe he's had all this cyberbullying people are sending him abusive messages and now he's not in school and joe put this message on facebook saying that's it i've had enough i can't take any more now i'm going to take drastic action that will show them make them regret what they did and what was what was interesting was they all went in very quiet when i read that say that, that section out and um and they had, as i was giving presenting them with each stage of this scenario i was asking them to to reflect on it but then discuss it with their partner the person sat next to them um I was a little disappointed that a lot of the children kept saying, I don't know, I don't know. I say, how do you think he might feel? I don't, and I think, I suppose an element of that is, here we've got um, a strange teacher that they've never met before. They don't really know what's what's going on, what's going to happen, and, and I'm asking them to tell me how they think um, a suicidal boy might feel. So that's probably part of it, and, and maybe they didn't want the risk of telling the audience in case they got it wrong. Um, whereas I've done this with other, okay, with smaller groups, maybe of 20 or 30, I've not done it with um, such a large group before, and maybe it was that risk of getting it wrong. Although there were one or two children in the audience who were quite happy to put their hand up and say what they thought the answer was. So that probably took about 20 minutes or so, reading the different stages. And the way I created this was, I, I just, I found a video, not a very good quality one, a, a couple of years ago. And actually quite like the story because it has an unexpected ending in it. So I asked them what they think that, that should happen next. And these, so if you're ever going to use this resource yourself, um, the questions are there large. So you could actually present the questions to the group. I, I hadn't managed to get the projector working at that point. So I was having to read the questions out. I mean, it might have helped if those questions there were displayed on the screen. So then the next element then was to say, well, we've actually got this film that Joe recorded. So let's go and watch the film. Now, we, we had a local copy of the film stored so that when we played it, we wouldn't have any issues with it. I think this takes you now to a, a clip on YouTube and you can see it's six minutes long. Now, I don't know if you can hear the audio coming through. So, so Joe talks about how bad he feels about what's happened, and he and he and he starts to tell a little bit of the story. He starts to tell a little bit of the story as he goes along. Oh dear, I think I've I shouldn't have played that YouTube video, <laughs> and I'm back. Yeah, so I won't play any more of the video, but. At, at various stages, you get to see the story. So you've got the pictures, and, and there's some very powerful music that plays as well, and some very powerful images. It's just a shame that this particular copy, the quality isn't great. And I once tried playing this on a sunny day, and the projector in the room wasn't very good. And um, so now, there's a point at the end where he, you realize he's told his mum what's happened and then his mum decides to, to go into school and and the story is that you know in the end joe won because he told friends and teacher and his parents and, and they managed to solve it and we get rid of that video clip in case it caused any more problems so th 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 there are some notes that you could use for a lesson plan now just so i know that you've not fallen asleep could you maybe just type something in like what you feel about the, the way that that's just been presented to you? Do you think that that's got any potential in your school or have you already done something like that in your school? You've seen the video before or um, you've done something almost exactly the same. That'd be quite useful. So 
we have a we have a, an e-safety program in our school that we deliver within our computing lessons and the way we have it planned is with year seven we focus on grooming with year eight we focus on cyberbullying year nine sexting year 10 we look at the digital footprint because we think that that's the point where they're starting to uh, apply for jobs and, and and that sort of thing so whatever year year group you might choose to use something that with what i particularly liked now i think my reflection is it doesn't work as well with an audience of you know 150 or whatever it was in front of you because you really need to allow people in groups to discuss the different things because some were saying oh um he could do this he could go and fight them he could do so it was interesting to hear and then as they made the different suggestions like um well he could turn around and he could call them names or he could just hold his head up and walk away it was a yeah, bit have you never been in a situation where all you wanted to do was cower and hide and it was trying to get them to empathize with that scenario and i think the issue there was because we were all sat in assembly and usually assemblies are all about sitting in silence it perhaps didn't work as well as, as i've found in some situations before so what i've presented to you there is really that's 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 about as much as happened in the first 40 45 minutes and then the next thing i did was i then said now I'm going to ask you today to build something this morning that will, that, that's great, Craig. I'm going to copy that link there that you've given me and I'm going to paste that into our document. Of course, I should really check to see what it is before I put it in there, but um, I'll just put that in there and we'll check out that later on. So um, I, I then talked to them and again, we had another thing, the projector switched off and we couldn't get it be switched, switched back on. So I was telling about how when I was 11 or 12 years old, I had um, a book and it was one of these choose your own adventure game stories or choose your own adventure. And the author, I think the original author died just last week. And it was a story where you would get choices on each page and it would say to you, do you want to go left or right? And if you went right, you would go to a certain page. If you went left, you might just die. And, and that was the end of it. But what you probably did was you thought, well, I was just checking to see what would happen on page 17. But really, I didn't die. So these adventure stories used to give you a chance, an opportunity to model different situations to see what might happen. Now, I've discovered um, about a year ago, a tool called Twine. So oh, there's actually a link to that in the document. So you can just click on it there, Twine. And so I said to the children, these are year eight pupils, so today we're, <clears throat> we're going to discover how we can use this tool called Twine to build up um, a story. And it's going to be like a story where you get lots of choices to make in the story and then you get to decide what's the happy ending and what's the sad ending and people have to follow the story. But the point of the story is it's to help people make the right decisions, especially when it comes to cyberbullying. So there are two versions that I've been using of Twine. There's the version that you can try in your browser and in your browser there's advantages it means you don't have to install anything you can just have the software there in the browser and you can but one of the disadvantages of the browser-based version is if you accidentally close the browser or if your internet connection is interrupted you can lose what you're working on so the other version is a, is a download which you install so i'm going to see i think i've got it installed on my computer and i just do a very short demonstration so i've actually got a version here that i just realized I'm... oh yes this is a good one to show you so this is like a model of facebook so your story could be based around a model of a facebook page now if you look at each of these blocks you'll see about how some of them are linked to each other so this one here that says home screen when i when i start this story in just a moment you'll see it will take me to the home screen and then i've got different options and choices i can go to so on my twine story i'm going to go to um test play so test play is going to open in my browser now i really hope it doesn't use a tab i've already got open let me just make a new tab just in case and then i'll try it so uh, back to twine build test play and here we are so I'm going to move my browser over here just so you can see this is this is what a, a twine story would look like when you when you finished it and 
you can use CSS to change how the page looks like. That's cascading style sheets. It, it alters how page, web pages look. So um, do you want to go and visit your home screen? Well, that's the only choice. So I click on there. And after I've clicked on there, then I've got all these alternatives that I can go down. So I can read my news feed, get my notifications, see what my friends are doing, or friend requests. So if I click on notifications, oh, I have no notifications at the moment. So I can go back to my home screen. Now, you can use this in lots of different ways. You could use this as um, somebody was saying um, something, I forgot the name. It's like logical path analysis. It's like a tool that you can use to help solve problems. Well, you. You could, if you choose, you could build one using this. Um, the other thing you could do is you could use it in, ah, so you can use it in a very simple way just to, to send people off on a journey. I'm going to see, I've, I've got some other ones that I've created. Um, so Monster and Gun. So this was another one I was creating. So this story starts at the beginning. And then you go here, it says you have a gun. And I've put in some variables in this. Now, you don't have to use variables to start with. It's it's quite a bit, a bit of a challenge. But it's just going to say you've got zero bullets and there's a monster. And it will tell you how big the monster is. And then you can decide if you want to shoot the monster. And there's all these different choices. What the, what the children did was they went off. And they had about an hour and a half then to use the Twine software, which was installed on their computers, to build a story. And, and we got them to build a story in pairs. And the stories were um, mostly about a cyberbullying scenario. And um, again, there was happy endings and sad endings. And you know, if you went this way, uh, you might commit suicide because it was all a bit too much. But if you went this way and asked and mentioned it to a friend, maybe your friend might mention it to somebody else, and then your parents and and before you know, like, oh, life's not quite as bad as you thought it was. And they just thought they were having a bit of harmless fun and they're not going to do it anymore. So that, that's how we use Twine. Now, you could use Twine for any other kind of situation. Clearly, it doesn't have to be related to cyberbullying. But it is a nice tool that does a couple of things. It gets you to think about <laughs> your actions and consequences. It's like the PSE kind of element. But it in the way that it executes itself as a web page, you've then got, you can actually start to talk about, well, how is it actually building this? And you can view the source. There's, I've got a tool here where I can go in and I can page source. You can start to look at the web page and see, well, what's actually in there? And let's scroll down, maybe, maybe, but you probably wouldn't really want to because it gets very, 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 um, muddy because there's all sorts of little tricks going on in here in javascript to make this story work now i'm going to just pause for a moment and ask have anybody seen that 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 this twine tool could be useful or relevant to the, the kind of things that they're doing in any way is it something that you've used before um do you think it might be um, an interesting way into thinking about selection first of all so within Computer science, we talk about flow. So you can have, so not selection, sequence to begin with. So you do this thing, this thing, this thing, and this thing. The other thing you can do is you can then use it to teach conditionals or selection. So if you do this, make a choice. And um, I'm just while I'm thinking about it, there's also the story I like to sh show sometimes is called um, My Father's Long, Long Legs. So sometimes I'll actually show them a story be to begin with just to get them to think about what the story is and how it works. So my father's long, long legs doesn't actually give you choices. It appears to give you a choice and it plays sound and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, a quiz, that might be an interesting, because you can actually embed variables in it. And you would use the Twine wiki that gives you, so anyway, this story here, you click on a dirt floor, blah, 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 you read through. And the thing I like about this is you change the descriptive narrative. Now, you can't embed video, but I do know that you can embed images into it. Because later on, this story, there's some images start to appear in the background. Some really cool stuff. I think if I can skip forward quite quickly, there's a bit where a torch or a flashlight starts to appear. And some of these are things that you can find online from other people's twine stories, and you can put them, embed them into your own. So uh, what I've often done, I've shown this to a class, 
move up into the read it and see if I can turn the lights off just to add a little bit of atmosphere. Um, this, I think, takes about 10 minutes to read this story. So I, I said to them to finish it off for a homework and then. Oh, you see, see wait, and then that one appears. Um, OK, I, I don't think, think I'm going to be able to wait till I get to the point to show you where the cool things start to happen. But it's a story, a story with a descriptive narrative. And the nice thing is when it starts to get you to believe the story, and you're hooked into it rather than just you go left, you go right, you go down a corridor, you're dead. It's nice to, and you know, if you're trying to look for a project where you can work together with the um, English department, perhaps. Now, this question has come through from Jamie about how tech, how tech it needs to be. Let me let me close this. Let me just actually show you how easy it is. So, so I've got two stories already open. I'll go and just make a new story. I'll drag it over here so you can see. So there's a new story when you see it. And you've got these three blocks, start, story title, and story author. I'd ignore those two for now. It, it, you don't really need to pay too much attention to them. And this, this block here, these are called passages. And this passage is called start. Now, it's, you can change the title of this one to something else, but you'll break it. So leave the first one as start. You can put tags in if you want, but you start start saying like so. Oh, I didn't want to type in. This is how technical it gets. So you write your story. You are in a corridor. Do you? And then now this is the bit where you put the choices in. You use square brackets. Do you walk down the corridor? Close with square brackets. Now, you'll not, if you can see this, it's red on my screen. You'll see how that, that'll change in a minute. Um, comma, rest for a while. Or um, lie down. No, that's the same thing. Well, so you get the idea. You can give it two choices there. So when I close that block now, do I want to create passages? Yes. So now those two passages that I linked to walk down the corridor, rest for a while, they now have their own separate entities. And I can go into the, this one here. So you, as you walk down the corridor, you get a pungent odor. You can start to build in like the drama as it goes on. Um, do you wish to cover your nose? And you could say if you like there's a poison gas and because you've covered your nose, then you can't breathe it. But again, do you, um, okay, turn left. I'm not very good at talking and thinking at the same time, or turn right. See, the best thing possibly would be if you can spend 15 minutes or so in a, in a lesson tomorrow, maybe show some aspect of this to a class just to see what their reactions are like. And it might be something, if you've got a bit more time, try it for a, a, a full lesson or so. And I mean, a lot of the things I try, I try it with a class, first of all, just to see how I get on with it. And I have some classes that are more forgiving than others. But it's when you start to get, you know, really get into the, what else can I do? I've just gone to About Twine. That takes you to the website. And then look for the wiki. So there's a Twine wiki. And it gives you a load of like examples and instructions and things that you can use. So um, do I show them the website first or Twine? In school recently, just because I did, it was just convenient to use it in a browser and not install it, I've been using it in a browser. But we, we've hit a couple of glitches where it didn't quite work in the browser. Whereas at the school we were at in Hull, I didn't know what their internet Wi-Fi was going to be like. So it was a good idea to have it installed. So it links to all these other tutorials that are online, giving you examples. And there's, there's videos, there's books, there's a glossary. So you could set that as a homework, find out what these five words mean, um, tips and tricks. And then there's, there's actually Twine Cities where you can go and publish your Twine story and share it with others. One thing to bear in mind is there's no... Um, in our school, there's, there's nothing stopping us from using it. I think I've asked them to allow it. 
So because anybody can write anything in Twine and it's unmoderated, you may find one or two stories that, um, okay, I'm gonna answer that question. You might find one or two stories that are just a little risque. Right? There's one that is, um, now I did a lot of digging around before I found this story. I didn't find it straight away, but I found one that was something about a, a young female um, exploring her kind of sexuality is that that's the best way i can say it. it there was nothing really graphic written in the story but it was all about you know she'd seen another girl and she didn't know whether she liked the other girl and you know she wondered what it'd be like if she kissed it but i could kind of imagine if i showed that to a class that would be a very difficult lesson maybe to calm them down because we're not everybody at the moment is okay with talking about those in lessons maybe we should be but um so what I've done is I've directed them towards two specific examples or one. If I read this story, my father's long, long legs, which I've read, and I know that there's nothing in there that's going to cause me any complications as a teacher in the classroom. It's just a, it's just a story that builds it up a little bit at a time and you're, ooh, what's going to happen next? And nothing jumps out. There's no like, wow, scary face. Those things don't happen. It's just, it's all in the narrative. It's it's really, really clever, this story, in the way it's written. And if anything, the, the punchline is a bit of an anticlimax, I would say. So how do you use the, the web version? You just click here, try the beta, and then you can it gives you options which you can skip. Oh, I, it's because I've used it before. So I'm going to have a story called the story, or I can make a new one. And here's one I've already created before. It's remembered. So, um, oh, no, this is an example. I think it would be useful more. Yeah, absolutely. It could be used for all of those kind of things. Um, so I can go into the example there. And you can see how this looks like the desktop version I was using before. To add images in, you give it a URL to where that image is stored, either locally or online, and it, and it does that. Um, OK, so that was going back to our agenda. <laughs> There's other things I was going to talk about that I haven't got around to. Um, but there's loads of stuff in there you can find and, and you can link and i've not even watched that video that that was mentioned before so that's that's twine there's it's a, it's a medium it's a way that you can share any kind of a story and that could even involve i started building one i just had this idea one day but i haven't finished it which is like a fault finding diagram to find out why your raspberry pi wasn't working and it would say things like have you plugged it in and you can say yes i have plugged it in and this is worth it. Critical path analysis, that's what it's called. I'm going to put that in. Critical path analysis. So it, it, it's used, or sorry, people say it's used in industry to like to solve problems. So is that true? If I, if I search for critical path analysis, what am I going to find? OK. So is it, Ah, okay. So it, it looks like there is some truth in that. So it's a way you, you could even use it to, as a system. And Natalie, yes, it exports as a web page. So when I was in Twine before, let me just go swap back to the desktop version. When you say build the story, so you can't see, but I'm, I'm clicking on an option to build it. It builds it as one page. It exports it as one web page only. So if I just call this one example, you don't have to type in .html, .html, and um, I'll put it here. When I click Save, you can see now it's called example.html, and all of that. If you look at the URL at the top, the URL doesn't change. So it's it's all embedded within one page. So you could actually just give the children like my father's long, long legs, you wouldn't have to say to them, right, go out and have a look online. Or I looked earlier to try and see if I could find a particular story that's really good. It's called Howling Wolf or How Howling Dogs. There's one that's called Howling Dogs, and it, it really got me hooked in. And um, But today, when I went to look for that, so there's Howling Dogs. It's, it's one of the best examples of a twine story. Calling dog twine. I'm going to get a message saying when I go on it, it's going to tell me it's blocked in school because it's a games website. But it might not be blocked in your school. So let me share the URL for that. You go around in circles a little bit in that story, but you notice 
things start to change and it's all like a dream sequence it's 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 quite clever it's one of the they're really good examples so okay now I, i'm hoping that you're finding some of this of value what i've been talking about you, you when you came on you probably didn't know i was going to talk about all of this um so maybe if you wouldn't mind just having some of the chat to say and be honest i spent too long on it or just about the right amount of time or you think this might be useful as something you could actually use so telling dogs there's a link and now I'm going to move on to teaching GCSE computer, which is just a little bit later than planned. The thing to bear in mind is all of this has been recorded. So, you, so um, if you think now, oh, I've got to go and uh, have a drink or, or come back, you can always watch the video afterwards. But I, I keep reading the, the chat. I've tried it where I've had microphones open and people can talk in, but it, we, we start to pick up other people's howling dogs and toddlers and things like that. But I can at the end open the microphone up if you actually want to use your voice to speak to me. So um, teaching GCSE computing. So I've brought some books along with me tonight. I'm just going to reach over and grab them. So I mentioned that today I had um, five visitors, five people. So so Mike, who's, who's watching the webinar tonight, Mike, Mike came on one of these days. He, he came into my school to learn about, well, learn to get ideas about teaching GCSE computing. And um, excuse me, we've changed the course now slightly because people kept saying, can we come in and watch you teach a class? And that's not always practical or, or, or easy. But, but when I do courses on Mondays now, it involves uh, lesson observation. And my colleague Joe came down as well and people were able to ask him. He's just started teaching computing this year. And he's kind of, yeah, actually, you know, in terms of it, it you know, and he's got a different group and it's, it's really useful now. We've got two of us teaching GCSE computing. So the lesson today, so I'm going to swap over in a moment to a different view. So there's a link here. This is to my teaching notes for my um, GCSE year 10 class. Craig, you're, you've been very complimentary. Thank you. Now, it looks like the video froze a moment. Here we go. I'm just going to pause. Video and sound, okay. Just checking because it looked like it was a bit glitchy just then a moment ago. Yeah, okay, I'll carry on. So <laughs> the the tricky thing is, uh, we did a five hour training course today, or is it six, six hours? And the first hour is all about working with the teachers, to keep trying to give them ideas, and then they come in over there and we teach a lesson. So it's it's uh, quite a bit of pressure, and. Um, Okay, so as long as you can hear me fine, that, that's good. So today with my year 10s was lesson 24 since September. So it was, it, it, and it's uh, our 12th week. And I'm trying to get my year 10 so that they're ready after Christmas to start the live assignment, the controlled assignment A453 for GCSE computing. And it's, it's going to be a programming task. It'll probably be just before the February half term when we start on that. And I'm going to mention this coding dojo thing and drills and stuff in a minute, but I want to tell you a little bit about the start of the lesson. So imagine what you might do if you were in the start of my lesson. So if you just think now, you're in year 10, you've done some homeworks recently. And the first thing I said was, okay, here's a sequence of numbers on the board. And now in the back of your book, could you please draw that image? Yeah, come on. And it was blank faces. And I think, Oh, sorry. Um, we did a homework about two weeks ago where you had to, you know, learn and understand that you can represent images in binary. You can represent the pixels. Um, you need metadata and color depth and resolution, all that kind of stuff. So, um, so because you can do that, I've now just given you an image there in binary. So go and draw it in the back of your book. Now, some people drew things in the back of their book, and some were sat there, and you could see the question marks hovering over their head. Just type in the chat, what kind of things do you predict or do you think that they drew in the back of their book? Oh, the, the actual book I wanted is over in the other pile and he wasn't in. Okay. So nobody's typing anything to the chat. So, um, you know, it should, it should be fairly obvious really because it's ones and zeros and it's coded in binary. 
but Mike's going, what? What on earth? Are, are the blocks or the bitmaps, whatever? So they started putting their hands up. Okay, so you can see my hand going up now. Um, sir, like, does the, does the one represent a color? Do, do, does it represent? So, so Lorna, way, where's Lorna come from? Lorna says, we need metadata. Now, not a single child in the class said we need metadata. What they actually said was, uh, um, how how big is the image? Is it is it colourful? Um, can we have a clue? I said, oh, I haven't actually given you any metadata, have I? So what I should have actually said was that this is, um, if you imagine, okay, um, one big block made up of four smaller blocks. So for example, I'm going to type this in the document now. This is my lesson plan. I'm typing this into. So if you imagine one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So we've got a matrix of four rows and four columns. Now go and draw the image. Ah, and then sure enough, some of them went away and they started drawing. And here is an example of one thing that they drew. Okay, so I'm pointing to the thing. So so somebody there has quickly figured out that the ones, they've decided that ones should be on and the zeros should be left empty. Let me just find another couple of examples. Now, I. I didn't need to do this. I could have just said to them, just just go and um, explain what metadata is or why we need metadata. There's another one. But as soon as I made that apparent to them, suddenly, <laughs> it, it was very obvious. So this is the point we're saying, do you remember the homework that we did a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you didn't do the homework. Oh, so you won't know what we're talking about. Ah, OK. So. Um, Oh, he wasn't in. So then I said, right, okay. So you figured out that the ones represent one. So uh, bits. So there we have a nibble. There we have another nibble. There we. Ha so we have four nibbles all together. So when you color that in, this is what we get. We get one, two, three, four. We get a one and another one. Okay. So I, I guess you figured it out quicker than the children did that that's how to do it. And then so. I then asked them, what's the shape? And we agreed it was a square. OK, so we can draw squares. Um, what shape should I get? So using the same matrix now, um, I gave you a shape. I'm now, which, you, which was encoded in bit patterns. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to um, write out the bit pattern for a circle using the same matrix. And then they start saying, it's impossible. No, you can't do it. I said. And some of them were drawing it, and then they realized they actually drawn a square. So how would you differentiate between a square and a circle? It was one or two in the class did this. They took the corners out of the square. They said, well, it's kind of a circle. Like that. Um, I said, it looks like, you, you know, are you missing something? So, oh, yeah, we need more pixels. Could we have, like, maybe another row? No, we could have another row. We could have another column. We I think we decided if we had eight rows and eight columns that would be easy to draw a circle but look at all this data because that means then you're going to have in order to draw a circle you're going to need this oh here so um eight rows eight columns that means we're going to have one two three one two three four five six seven eight that's an awfully big number just to draw a circle and even then when we draw the circle it's not very nice, really. I suppose uh, if we're going to give the circle, start making it look a little bit smooth, we probably need maybe that many. But that becomes a very tricky number to remember. And then we've got to store the number. And so the point then I was trying to demonstrate is the, the relationship between resolution and the size of an image file. And of course, this is only black and white. What if I asked them to do a red circle on a green background? So. That was really the first part of the lesson. And if you'd been there, you'd have seen a little bit about how that emerged and developed. At the same time that the teachers who came in today to watch the lesson, they were talking to some of the children from my class that were next door. And they weren't doing exactly the same thing next door. They are doing that kind of thing. Um, they got to talk to them as well. Now, the, this is the way I'm teaching the theory. Every week, every lesson or so, I'm probing and prompting and getting them to think about the things that we have been doing as the homework. Now, when I'm talking about homeworks, all of our homeworks are here in that document. You go to where it says homework topics. 
And if I go back to week nine, so I'm setting one topic a week. And you've got now links to all of these. You can do with these whatever you want. They're read only, so you can copy them and use them with your own children or point your. So there's the images homework that was set. Um, I'll go back one stage. It was actually, I think it was set before the halftime holiday. Yeah, look at that. Week nine, less, uh, homework nine, and that was, no, the week after we came back from the halftime holiday. So back to the homework topics. So for homework, what I've done is I've taken all of the expectations, Shirley, um, Jamie, I'll come on to your questions in just a minute. Just make sure I'm reading the chat, what's going on in the chat. Okay. Um, so I'll come back to those questions in a minute. So I've taken all of the OCR GCSE specification and I've divided it up into 39 chunks. So those 39 chunks um, are all of it. And I said, you know, because we have four, about 40 weeks in the school year, by the time we get to the end of the school year for homework, they will have covered every single particular topic, but not to a huge amount of depth or detail. So I'm topping that up with some um, learning that we're doing in the classroom, like we did today, and they, they were the three topics. So the book, now, so it says book, page 16. So this is what I would do. I would say that they've been provided with a paper copy of this book. It's the Susan Robson GCSE Computing Book. Now, as our GCSE class has grown, we've had to purchase more and more copies of this book. The first time I bought it was four pound, then it went up to six pound and seven pound. And now um, PG Online have released um, a color version with photographs in, ooh, color photos, and it's I think 17 pounds. Let me just check to that in here somewhere. Um, and I'm sorry, but I really can't afford to start buying books that are 17 pounds each, especially when a lot of the other material, uh, you know, I've, anyway, um, give me a moment. Computing. So I've got a link to, if you want to buy the book, if, you, if you've got plenty of money and you can afford it, this is where you can go. So 24 November, okay. I'm looking for a link, which I know is going to be around about here on this page. So it, it's, this is if you want to buy the book, buy the book, buy the book. So, so the Susan Robson book now, I think the, I think it's owned now by PG Online. And if you want it, you can now buy it from there. So this will now tell, tell us how much the book is. Um, now to order, pricing information. Of course, you have to go through everything else to find it. So um, the printed book, okay, sorry, it's £15.20. Oh, and if you buy a lot of them, then it's 20% off. So I'm not sure, is that the, I don't know if that's the same book I was looking for, but, but it is in there somewhere. Okay, you can look for it later on. So we actually bought the PDF version of the book. So the children have got access to the PDF version as well as some having the paper copy. <laughs> um, there's something in the chat that, that I'm laughing at, and I don't know why I'm laughing because I haven't read it. So I need to go back. Oh, okay. Representing images using. Now, I did think about doing that today, and then I thought, oh, I wish I'd got some beforehand rather than just drawing it in the back of their book. So, yeah, like the, the old mastermind game. That's a really good idea. So, Lorna is suggesting um, that you could have cards or pegs to model the pictures. Like, Anyway, okay, so so I going back to the question about homework, I set one homework every every two weeks our children have five lessons and of those five lessons five lessons of those five lessons they prescribed three homeworks. Two of the homeworks, so week A, week B, each homework is all to do with the book, which I've just shown you a link to the homework topics there. So we're in week twelve now so this week when i set them homework it wasn't today their homework will be the cpu now in addition to the book i'm also suggesting that they look at the mooc 
So Simon, you're saying you think Susan Robson's book is still the best. This is this is the the very same one that I'm talking about. And um, and as Simon is saying, it is very much like flipped learning, because I'm providing them links to all the resources. Now flipped learning um, it has its doubters, and I'm one of them, because it does not work for everybody. Some children who are very very highly motivated, um, it works perfectly well, but it doesn't. So I have some children who they've no discipline, um, motivation, or anything, and they just don't. They just don't do the homeworks. So how, how do I compensate for that? Oh, come on to that in a minute, but let me just show you the MOOC. So the MOOC, if go back to this page. So the MOOC, it says page 36 and page 37. So you'll recognize the MOOC in a moment. This is the OCR, Cambridge University Press MOOC, and it says to go to 36 and 37. Well, blow me, look, 37, metadata in images. And there's like little links there. And there's a video. Oh, my friend Ilya. Oh, don't play the video. It's going to crash everything. Um, right. I think. Okay. So, so the site has actually got all of the content, but some of the children say, "Oh well, you have to go online and all the rest," and they just rather have the book. So some of them have the book. So again, back to the homework topics. Um, I also have. You'll notice. I just need to add some more in. I've been adding in BBC bite size references as well. So characters the week before, it says P4 and 5. Oh, I need to add some more in. So um, you just click OK, yeah, that's fine. And we look for page 4 and 5. Now, there's actually five pages altogether. That's page 4. And we're looking for images, metadata. Oh, sorry, I should have said that this is all about character sets. So this BBC bite size topic has videos and, and little sound bites you can listen to. And that, so that also has. So really, you don't actually have to have the textbook. There's a lot of content already online, and you could link to things like Wikipedia, although my experience with Wikipedia is on the pitch very high for GCSE. So that's setting of the homeworks. Um, if you look at that document that I've been using when I'm talking about the very top there's actually a youtube video that i recorded for parents where i've explained about how we use the textbook and and i also in the video i talk about so these are our homework books so this lady she has not glued her pages in so all my children are provided with a textbook and they have an exercise book for homework now did you notice before i had another exercise book so they've actually got three books all together, and some of them have got plastic wallets to keep them all in. So the blue book is classwork only. The orange book, homework only. And when you open the homework book, you're confronted with this page. And if you say yes, please, what I'll do is I'll share a link to this page. So you've got the electronic version of it. But it says things like, here are the five criteria that you need to meet so I'm waiting for the video to catch up. There's five criteria that you need to meet to score five out of five. And it's not like how clever you are or if you're in the top math set or anything like that. There's simple mundane things like, have you put a title and date at the top of the page? Um, have you included a minimum of words? That means I do not want you to copy all of the text off the BBC webpage or from the MOOC or from the, the book, because copying things out just does not work. Now, I've got some kind of extreme examples to show you. So so for images, so Zahida needs to glue her page in, but this, this is what her homework looks like for page nine. So she's, um, I think she's, she's, I think she's been on the MOOC. Oh no, she's looked in the book because I recognize that picture. Um, that's how you, you kind of know that they've done the homework. So can you see the flower image there? That flower image there looks awfully like that flower image there. Now, it was funny that, uh, actually, because Zahida was one of the ones saying about, she started talking about you'd need bit depth to store the colors today. So she, that, that homework is clearly working for her. And um, so Nobody said yes, please. So you don't want me to share that document at the front of the book that explains what to do. So I won't share it then. <laughs> okay, I will in a minute. 
So here's another example. Now, this child, I won't mention their name because I might embarrass them. But to begin with, this child wasn't doing any homeworks. And then they realized that I was sharing the scores that they get for the homework with their parents. So um, he actually, he was coming each lesson. Sir, sir, you're going to collect the homework books in today. But I collected them in last lesson. I know, but um, I've done it now. I've done it. So when he says he's done it, what that means is I go to my mark book, which is also online that you can go and look at. And you can, um, it's at the very top where it says homework progress. You click on there and here we have all of the homework. So that child I've just been showing you to begin with, hadn't done a huge amount of homeworks, but now he's, he's really keen and getting all of them done. But you'll see there's some children who very rarely do homeworks but this is year 10 they're still kind of keen and enthusiastic so there are some that do every single homework with style now i need to put in here which i haven't done yet myself. i need to put the test scores in there so you can see the effects of the homework i've got it with another class so if i go to another class now and to open up another page that's tiny url.com slash 10 b computing now i'm watching the clock i think we're pretty much at the end and i haven't answered um, natalie's questions yet so 10 b computing i'll put that in the document i think this takes you to my year 11 class and i've been doing exactly the same system with my year and when i click on homework topics this is where the real magic comes in so um Every couple of weeks, that's in the video I'm going to explain. Every couple of weeks, we do a testing class. And the test is a quiz which is hosted on our Moodle site. And these Moodle questions are a multiple choice. And what it does is it gives them all a score, how to, it gives them a percentage. Now, the children that I teach in year 11, they all have target grades at GCSE. Now, let's go this way. What I've done is I've converted their raw target grade into a percentage. So if your target grade is an A star, then your target will say 76. So if I click on a child here and don't tell you their name. Can you see up here it says 56? Yeah. And I click on another one like this one here that says 46. So that child whose name I've just clicked on, their target grade is a C. Now I would be, wow, if that child got a C, I would be Oh, yes, I've finally done it. Um, let's find another one. So this one over here, their target, their target grades are 46 as well. Okay. So when they do these score, these quizzes, it gives them a score. So this child here, their target is a 76. And when they did the test, oh, blow me. They got a 76 as well. So now can you figure out what this column is here? And if you can't, you can just look over there. It tells you it's the score they got in the test. <laughs> Bye, Mike. Okay. Uh, subtracted from their target score. So it might look like this child has done rubbish in the test, but actually no, because their target grades are aspirational. So like, on a great day, they do everything, they do all the homeworks, what's the best they could get? And that's the expectation. So it's green. On this time, they didn't do quite as well. They got a 68, so that was eight below their expected target grade. Well, their target grade, so they, that's what they got in eight. And then on this one, Mm, they got 24 below. Now, 52 is still, if you look, it's still a C, but it's below their target grade. So um, there are patterns. You, you tend to see things like, for example, the children who do all of the homeworks tend to get the, the highest test scores. And um, I mean, uh, is that a surprise? I don't know. But I, I need to put those in for my year 10s. I've got the scores. I just haven't pasted them in. And I'm sending emails home regularly to my year 11 parents where I'm saying things like, oh, um, your child never does homework and I'm running an after school homework club next week. And it's after it's on Wednesday and Thursday and I'd really like them to come. And then some of them will come and then some of them won't come. And the ones who won't come, they do um, they do homework club, but in lesson. But when everybody else is programming or working on the Raspberry Pis or, or whatever, the person who hasn't done the homework does their homework in class. And they hate it, but, and I hate it, but they don't do the homework. So there has to be some kind of consequence for not doing their homework. Now, 
Um, the thing I, I, I just need to mention a little bit and then, and then we'll stop is um, the coding dojos and drills. And Natalie, I also need to answer your question. So very briefly, I know that my year 11, 10s are going to be doing a programming assignment. My year 10s are going to be doing a programming assignment in February. And I need to get them ready so that so whatever I throw at them, they can cope. So back in my year 10 lesson notes, there's a thing where it says programming. And when I click on this, I've got all of the requirements for OCR programming. And they're here. And what I'm trying to do at the moment is I'm trying to build up their confidence and capability using these. So, so A, identify use variables, operators, inputs, outputs, and sounds. I'm now feeling pretty comfortable that all of the class can use that or, or understand what these things are, although they get rusty because they haven't been doing it as long as I have. I've been doing it since September 2011, and, and they haven't been doing it quite as long as that. One thing I know that, that we haven't done any of, and I wouldn't expect that they'd be able to do very well, and this is basic string manipulation. We haven't done any file handling. We haven't even talked about what an array is yet because it's just not come up on our um, on our program. But we're getting there, and the plan is that um, in the next couple of weeks or so, we're getting closer and closer. So um, drills, dojos and drills. Now, I think the caretaker, Stephen, is going to come in and tell me that he's locked in the building. Up. Did you play the door, though? Okay, he might come in in a moment. So how much Python have your students done so far in those five lessons over two weeks? So here we can find out. And you can find out yourself if I don't tell you the answer straight away. You can look through now. And you can see two lessons ago. So um, I've said to my year 10s, have a look at this. I'm going to ask you to build something that does that. So the blue bit is the computer speaking. The black bit is the, uh, the, ch the user. And I set them a couple of things ago. List. So what are the requirements of your algorithm design? Design the algorithm and then build it. Hello, Stephen. I'm just checking everything switched off. So um, if I look back to find an example of something that they coded, you've been very good, saving our school lots of uh, money. You won't turn this one off yet, will you? Because I'm still using this one. No? OK. I have. Um, I didn't think we locked the inside one. Sorry, I thought we only locked the outside one. You'll be throwing me out in a minute, but I've got my own key. So, but the, the question was, how, like, how much have they done? And I'm trying to shine, find an example of something that they've done. Like here, for example, they were able to complete these challenges. <laughs> uh, create a program to ask the use of two numbers, divide the largest by the smallest, open it like this. So these are the kind of things that they're now just about able to cope with. Only just. That was after eight weeks. And if you look back through all of my notes, you'll see there's, there's loads of references to programming right from the very first lesson. So like um, seven, week seven, that was about five weeks ago. This is the kind of thing that we were looking at in class. That's got some errors in it. And I was expecting that they could point out what those errors were. So I just need to lock the doors, gates, and alarm. OK, thank you. Bye now. So do whatever you want with those notes. If you want to use any of them, try them any way, then you can do. If you want to send me a message and say, could you explain what did you do in week 11 or week 12 or, or a particular lesson, I can mention that in a future one of these webinars. So I'm, I'm trying to respond to the questions as they come up. This is like the Q&A bit. And, um, so the drills, the point of this is every single week now, I'm setting coding drills for my class. And I'm trying to set them all sorts of different challenges, inside, outside, upside down. And I'm getting to work in pairs an awful lot of the time. You might have seen me mention that in previous webinars where they have, we have a driver and a navigator. Every five minutes, they swap over. Then we do other things to mess it up where the, all of the, 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 the navigators swap with the group next to them. Uh, we, played, we played sabotage today. Um, what was funny was the people who were observing the lesson, the smile broke out when I said, OK, class, we're going to play sabotage. And suddenly the children's whole 
body language changed. Like, oh, cool, we're going to bring sabotage. Because they, they love catching each other out with sabotage. It's just funny how it really, um, it just like gets them switched in. So, um, yeah, like longer than planned, but I've covered all of that topic. And now just to wrap it up, the next couple of minutes, Natalie, at the start of tonight, she was on before all of you, Natalie, the early word, and she said, which exam board, which programming language? So the answers are, for me, it's Python and OCR. And if you've had enough now, you can say goodbye and type it in. And while well, I just tell Natalie about my rationale for choosing those. So VB, in, in, in Preston, our school that I teach at is 11 to 16. And I know that when children, if they choose computing at A-level, they go to our partner sixth form college. Bye. And at the partner sixth form college, they teach VB. And when I said to the sixth form college, like that we might be teaching VB, you could see they were kind of like, oh gosh, so are we going to have to like unteach the things that you've taught them or will you teach it so well that we won't? So I thought, well, maybe I'll look for another programming language. So I started looking at other ones and a lot of people were saying, Java, Java, Java. And I looked at Java and uh, it might as well have been Greek. I just did not have a clue. I tried doing lots of stuff and I, I had braces and brackets in the wrong place and it, and it was causing me nightmares. I thought, I really can't teach this to a class. So I went and looked at lots of other ones like Small Basic and others. And the last square I got to before I stopped was Python. Now I just find for me, a child who grew up in the 80s, I did have some experience of basic as a child, a teenager. And I just find that Python just makes so much sense. It's easy to read. <laughs> it's, um, I like the, the way it uses spacing. There's a lot of stuff in it that makes sense. I know some people say there's a couple of little things that they're not that keen on, but I think you're going to find that with any programming language. So the other thing I like about Python is it comes from the open source community. And I'm always kind of a proud member of the open source community like these bye Simon these webinars I'm trying to make them free all the resources I'm trying to share for free so why would I be then trying to get you to use a programming language that is not necessarily well, it's free if you have Windows but also it's VB is not part of the open source community ah should be free parking on the school site yes on Saturday oh good to see you Craig come and say hello and um, where Python is. And because Python is not owned by a big company or corporation like Google or Microsoft, you don't have to get permission to use the name Python. So I can say I'm doing a Python course and I don't have to get permission from anybody to do that. I don't have to get permission to write a book. Whereas if I'm talking about using Microsoft Visual Basic or Microsoft Visual Studio, I do need permission from Microsoft in order to do that. So that's another one of my reasons. AQA versus OCR, I think a lot of people have heard this already. Are you still there, Natalie, or am I talking to myself? Um, so the graphical interface in Visual Basic. Yeah, it, it, I, I've heard people say it does make life a little, a little easier. Um, but we're, we're talking about 15-year-olds. And I, I don't mind showing 15-year-olds what the real world looks like. And text-based is, is, is the way to go for the win. However, I will admit that the class I've got at the moment, they don't seem to, they don't seem to have found the same kind of excitement in text-based programming as some of the other classes when it was all new. So things I'm starting to introduce with them are things like Minecraft and Pygame, because they are graphical environments in which they can, um, oh my goodness, 3.12 in the morning. So um, you should be watching the video recording. So um, I, I'm going to stick with Python for the moment. That does not mean it is the only programming language, because I, I have friends who use VB, and they love it. They really do. So Natalie, if you know what you're doing, stick to your guns and stick to VB. It's just not my flavor. And the other thing about VB is you can't program the Raspberry Pi, and you have a Pi club, and you're showing them how to use a programming language that you can't actually use on the Raspberry Pi. AQA versus OCR, it's almost exactly the same kind of thing again. OCR, I'm feeling they're 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 not open source, but they're they're very sort of connected with the open source community. They're trying to make things like the MOOC online for free, whereas as far as I can see, AQA are selling courses and books and all sorts of things and 
and yeah there's another company called Pearson and they have they have an exam course that you can follow and you can buy all of their resources yeah yeah I, I'm trying to do things in a way that where, they, where bar cost shouldn't be a barrier the other thing about OCR for me um, four years ago it was the only GCSE that was out there so it was an easy choice for me where AQA and Edexcel have come later on so the Edexcel I don't actually know anybody that I can sort of like say hello there's Mike I don't know anybody who's teaching the Edexcel one at the moment I knew one per I knew two people who were teaching the AQA one um, Dave and oh my goodness his name's gone um, in, Brian I knew Dave and Brian were teaching it and they and, and Dave doesn't teach it anymore and neither does Brian so they all have their reasons for not teaching it anymore so the thing I liked about OCR it's a big community lots of people sharing things on CAS but the thing about CAS is if you're in a minority like AQA or Edexcel it's a great place to go to because you can share it with all of them okay um, I, it's not to say that OCR are perfect and you won't have any faults with OCR I've not had, but but you may well do. I'm just saying it's worked for me. Okay. But Natalie, if you know exactly what you do and stick to your guns, the situation not to be in is, oh, well, we're doing AQA because school says we have to. You're the one who's going to be teaching it and delivering it. So you choose the one that suits you. Now, I do need to go. I need to, I've got home to go to and all the rest. Thank you very much for watching and listening. Um, in a day or two, you'll get an access to re recording this with, it, with a few notes for the different sections. You don't have to watch the, the whole thing. Thank you very much and goodbye. And if I see you on Saturday in Eccles, um, bring some kids along and say hello and show me something that, that you've learned on the day. So I'm going to click end session now and um, do you know what I should have done first of all? I should have ended the recording first of all, that would have made sense.